Uh, just a quick uh, rundown of what uh, the organization is all about. We're based in Queens, New York, and Baruch Hashem, in the last 10 years, over 10 years, we've been able to enlighten and, and ignite this spiritual spark of thousands of people throughout the community and getting people to come to Shira and get, get inspired and change their lives and make the world a better place. And uh, about a year or two ago, we got in touch with the Asi this to me, who Baruch Hashem said we have to do the same thing in NYC. In the Lower East Side in particular, and Baruch Hashem, ever since she got involved, she really took things to the next level, and many, many Shira have been going on over here in the community. I think she deserves a round of applause for all the great things that she's done over here. And we're very excited for our first year in this shul, Mitzvah Hashem, the first of many, and uh, looking forward to working with Brother Yom and the community of Mitzvah Hashem. And uh, Baruch Hashem, the goal is to uh, spread the light and to do good and to help Am Yisrael. Uh, our main focus with Chazak right now currently is that there is a mini Churban about 20-30 minutes away from here. It's called uh, Forest Hills, Queens, where we have about approximately 10,000 of our fellow brothers and sisters in local public schools, and they have no connection, no shaykhs to anything about Yiddishkeit, and our goal is to place them at the yeshivas. In the last 15 months, we Baruch Hashem placed over 354 kids from public school to yeshiva, and Baruch Hashem... Baruch Hashem, it's been a, a big success, and we started after school programs and Sunday school programs and the teens division. It's a whole revolution and a movement that's happening where Baruch Singer sitting over here knows a little bit about it. He's Baruch Hashem close to our Rav, our Dasar, Rav Obaum, and Baruch Hashem, the organization is spreading light and changing the world. One of the programs that we have are the 25 different programs, and the cherry on top is the Shiurim. Uh, throughout the communities, Baruch Hashem, thanks to Rabbi Eva, who's over here from the organization. We have about a dozen different uh, branches, quote unquote, of uh, Shiram, the Chazak and YC over here tonight. We have Lakewood, we have Bar, Park, Flatbush, Muncie, Five Towns, Greenick, and many, many other communities. If anybody over here has a shul or a community that wants some Shiram, some programming, some life, some energy, we're always ready, willing, and able. So please come and see myself, or with Rabbi, or Dasi, or anyone else involved in the Chazak organization. At this time, I have the big honor of calling upon the Maharaj Yassi, the Rabbi the Shul, Rabbi Ram. The Baruch Hashem is gracious enough to open this door. Let's give a round of applause to Rabbi Ram. The words of the introduction. I want to just start by thanking the uh, the organizers of this evening, Rabbi Yaniv uh, Heimoff, of course, Aron uh, Dasi uh, Sif uh, Lichman. and uh, Rab uh, Rabbi Aboff for uh, ably putting everything together tonight. Uh, the Gemara tells the story of one of the Tanoim who was acknowledged, one of the rabbis in the Talmud who was acknowledged as being brilliant by all of his peers, and yet he moved away for various reasons at a certain point during his life from being involved in the yeshiva learning together with the rest of his peers. And things got so bad, says the Gemara, that when he came to lane from the Sefer Torah, to read from the Sefer Torah, this week, Parshas Bo, when the Torah says, HaChodesh Hazel Ochem Rosh Chodoshim, that this month is for you, the month of Nisan is for you, the beginning of months, instead of reading HaChodesh Hazel Ochem, this month is for you, he read instead, HaCheresh HaYolibam, the hearts of the people are so dull, and they're so deaf to what's going on outside, that they're unable, the words of Torah are, are unable to penetrate into their hearts. And when this, this Rav, this Tana saw that even his Hebrew reading had uh, generated to the point where HaChodesh Hazel Ochem became HaCheresh HaYolibom, he realized that he had really strayed and needed to come back to the, prop, to the proper path of learning. Our very chosh of the guest tonight, Rav Zev Lev, and it's really a tremendous chos, a tremendous source of merit that we have him here in the shul, uh, is an individual who has spent and continues to spend his entire professional life trying to take those for whom hacheresh hayolibam, people for whom their hearts are hardened, their hearts are perhaps callous, their hearts are deafened to the words of Torah that emanate from the outside, and he works on them and attempts to convert HaCheresh HaYolibam to HaChodesh HaZelochem. Chodesh, we know, doesn't only mean month, but it's related to the word Chodosh, something which is new, something which is invigorating, something which is exciting. And Rev. Lev has brought and continues to bring the excitement and the enthusiasm of Torah learning to a multitude of many, many different forums. 
He is the Rav and Mar Daasra of Moshav Matityahu, a Moshav outside of Kiryat Sefer in Eretz Yisrael. He's also the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Gedolah Matityahu. He oversees the 20 member Kolo, which is on the Moshav. Additionally, he teaches a group of unaffiliated Israelis who live near Moshav Matityahu. And he lectures at several leading Israeli yeshivot, seminaries, and institutions, including the Orthodox Union's Israel Center. He's a featured speaker at the conventions of the Orthodox Union, the Agudas Yisrael, and Torah, and Masora. And Bar Hashem, we have the very singular schus to be able to hear Harav Lev tonight. Without further ado, we introduce you. It's a cover to introduce Harav Zev Lev. Now that the has paid them are over, we can uh, start with something else. Bishusa uh, Mora the Asra. I tell you, I came here tonight because an organization that's called Chazak, I figured I could get some chizuk from. So uh, I'm hoping that that will be the case. And uh, the Bialystok Shul is a landmark in uh, American Jewry, and it's a schuss to be here. I'm sure these walls have absorbed a lot of Torah and a lot of tefillah from a lot of very special people. So I wish the Rav here a lot of Hatzlocha to continue all of that. We speak about uh, the importance of uh, growing constantly in Torah and aspiring towards higher and higher spiritual levels. The Medrash says, Rabbi Akiva Hayadoresh, Rabbi Akiva was giving a drasha, Ubikshu atalmidim lenamnim, and his students began to go to sleep. Nothing has changed in 2,000 years. Ubikesh <laughs> la'orodom, and he wanted to wake them up. So he said to them the following, Marosa Esther, Shemolcha al Neavi Esen Vesheva Medinos. What did Esther see that enabled her to rule over 127 provinces? El Tavo Esther, Basbita Shosara, Shechoisa Neavi Esen Vesheva Shonim. Let Esther, the great great granddaughter of Sara, who lived 127 years, rule over 127 Medinos. They all woke up, because what in the world is there any connection between the 127 years of Sara and the 127 provinces of Esther, except that they're the same number? And Rabbi Akiva went on. The Mikhtab Meliyahu says, it's unreasonable to assume that Rabbi Akiva only said something startling to wake up his students. There must have been a message involved. And he says the following. Rabbi Akiva surmised that the reason that his students were falling asleep was because he was speaking about levels way beyond them. And they reasoned, why do we have to listen to this? It's way above us. We'll get some rest, and when Rabbi Akiva comes down to our level, we'll be well rested and be able to listen. Rabbi Akiva told them, you're making a big mistake. Do you know how Esther was able to be a queen and rule over 127 Medinos? Because her whole life she aspired to be like Sora, who lived 127 years. And Chazal say, it wasn't just that 127 years passed over Sora, but Kulam Shovim Litova, every year, every second of Sora's life, all of them were equally good, equally for the good. Now that can't mean that it was equally good, because it wasn't. The 90 years she was barren was not as equally good with the 37 years she had Yitzchak. The night she was dragged to Paro or Avimelech was not equally good to the day they celebrated Yitzchak's bris. But it doesn't say they were equally good. It says they were equally for the good. Meaning Sara Imenu was able to rule over every second and direct every event in her life 
for the good. That is real malchus. That's royalty. And Esther aspired to be like Sarah. She never reached the level of Sarah. But because she aspired to the highest levels, at least she reached the potential that she had. If you don't aspire towards higher and higher goals, then you'll never be able to reach even your own potential. Not only that, but sometimes you can even create more potential. It says that when Esau came in and found out that his brother Yaakov had taken his blessings, so he said to his father Yitzchak, Borcheni no gamon ani, you must have something left. Give me a bracha too. And Yitzchak told him categorically, there's nothing left. I gave him everything. There's no more brachas. And Esau began to cry bitterly. And immediately after that, Yitzchak blesses Esau with a slew of blessings that we're suffering from till today. So the question is, where do those blessings come from? A minute before, there were no more blessings. The Bali Musar say, that when Esau cried and wanted those blessings and aspired towards them, it created new blessings in the heaven. So one can create new potential if you aspire towards goals with the right uh, uh, intensity. My Rosh Yeshiva, my Rebbe, Reb Mordechai Gifter, Zecher Tzadik Livrocha, said there are a few Gemaras that have the same style, and you can ask the same question and give the same answer. For instance, the Gemara says, If you want to be wise, you should dive in towards the south. A little bit towards the south. Because the menorah was in the south, and the menorah was a source of wisdom. So if you dive in towards the south, it's a school for wisdom. Or the Gemara says, A person who wants to be a chassid should learn the laws of brachos and perkei avos and the laws of damages. My Rosh Hashiva said the Gemara always speaks in the most concise way. doesn't waste a letter, let alone words. Why did it say whoever wants to be a chacham should daven to the south? It should have said if you daven to the south, you'll be a chacham. He said the answer is very simple. If you don't want to be a chacham, you can daven towards the south a thousand times a day. You'll never be a chacham. Everything starts with a desire, with a want. You want, you aspire, then you'll be able to reach goals. If you don't want, you can never reach anything. And that's why to a living person, we always say to him, Leich lishalom. Shalom does not necessarily mean peace. Shalom means shlemus, perfection. A living person is always going towards perfection. He's never reached it. There's always something more to accomplish, something more to do when it comes to spiritual things. It's only to a person who no longer is alive and we're bidding farewell to him for the last time before we cover the grave and then we say leich bishalom. Go with the perfection that you have that's it. Whatever you accomplish, you accomplish. There's nothing more that you can do. But a living person is always going, leich lishalom, is going towards perfection more and more. The, this applies to everyone. It even applied to Moshe Rabbeinu. The Gemara says that when Moshe Rabbeinu first encountered God's presence through an angel in the burning bush, so he covered his face. He was afraid to look. It was humble. It was modest. Cover his face, not to look. The rabbis argue, what was the result of that? One opinion was that in the merit that Moshe Rabbeinu covered his face and was humble and modest, later on his face shone with the brightness of the Shechin, of God's presence. Later on, he came down from Har Sinai, and the people couldn't even look at his face. It was shining. He had to put on a mask. The other opinion says, no, Moshe Rabbein was punished. 
And later on, when Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hareini noes kvodecha, God, let me see your glory. God answered him and said, Kishirotzisi lo rotzisa. When I wanted to show you my glory in the burning bush, you didn't want to look. Achshav sha'ata rotsa, now you want to look? And then he, and then he wrote, sir, I don't want to show you. Two problems. First of all, we rarely find arguments that are so polarized from one extreme to the other. One says he got blessed and rewarded for what the other one says he got punished. One could say he got punished, he didn't get punished, he got rewarded, didn't get, but one says he got punished for what the other one says he got rewarded. And secondly, it doesn't sound like God. It sounds like a six-year-old spiting somebody. Oh, when I wanted to show you, you didn't want to look. And now you want to look, I don't want to show you. And therefore, I think there's really no argument here. Everybody agrees that Moshe Rabbeinu had to cover his face out of modesty, out of humility, and he was rewarded for it. The opinion that says that he was punished is not talking about the fact that he covered his face. It doesn't say, when I wanted to show you, you didn't look. It says, when I wanted to show you, you didn't want to look. Everybody agrees that Moshe Rabbeinu should have covered his face. But from behind his fingers, he should have been saying, when will come the day that I'll be able to look? When I wanted to show you, you didn't want to look. And therefore, since you didn't aspire to that from that time, then you're not able to reach it even now. Even a Moshe Rabbeinu, who doesn't aspire to higher and higher levels, is not going to reach them. So that is how important it is to aspire and to grow. How bad is it not to aspire and not to grow? Someone once told me this world is like a down escalator that you're trying to run up. Children do it all the time. Adults would like to do it, but they hold themselves back. Sometimes. If you run up a down escalator and you stop, you go down. If you make some effort, you'll at least stand where you were. And if you make a lot of effort, you'll get a little bit higher. In this world, you can't stagnate. If you stop, inevitably, you are going to go down. How far down? There's a Rashi in the beginning of Parshish Bechukosai, which I would like to elucidate to you. The Torah says, in Bechukosai, Telechu, in Chazal say, Telechu, you should put effort into Torah. And if you do, the Rabbanu Shem promises utopia, the ideal circumstances in which to serve the Rabbanu Shalom. sishmuli, says Rashi. But if you don't put effort into Torah, then you will go down seven levels. The last one being kofar be'ikr. You'll deny God. We'll get to the seven levels in a second. But from not putting effort into Torah, this is what happens. Now, first of all, you have to understand what that means to put effort into Torah. So probably for a man who's sitting and learning Torah, it means putting his feet in ice water and learning 20 hours straight. That's amelus by Torah. But that doesn't apply to most of us. And the Torah applies to everybody. So what is amelus by Torah? Think a melus Torah, putting effort into Torah means improving, changing for the better, which is very, very difficult. People like to be comfortable. They don't like to make changes in their life, and they surely don't want to improve, whether it's the Torah learning that they do, or their character traits, or their yirashomayim, or their mitzvahs. I did it yesterday like this, I'll do it tomorrow like this. It takes a lot of effort to be able to improve and to change for the better. So if you put effort into Torah, little by little, you'll, you'll progress in Torah, 
then you'll be given the circumstances that are ideal for keeping the Torah. But if you don't put that effort and you want to stagnate and you want to practice what I call uh, status quo Judaism, this is the way I kept Shabbos last week and this is the way I'm going to do it next week, and I don't want to change, then you'll go down seven levels. Now, on the surface, that doesn't seem realistic because I know a lot of people that never change, never improve, are not interested in improving. And they're fine, Shomer Shabbos Yidin. They're not Kofrim Beiker. They're not, not heretics. They're nice people. Shomer Shabbos. So what do you tell me? Give them another year. They'll be a Kofrim Beiker. I know people who've been like that for three generations. And they're still fine, observant Jews. What are you going to tell me? That deep down they don't believe in any of this. I find that extremely difficult to believe. So what does it mean? So let me tell you what I think it means, and it is so realistic that it applies to all of us. Not us here, everyone. And I'll tell you a story how I know it applies to everyone. Let's use the following uh, uh, story as a basis for what I'm going to tell you. When I was a rabbi in Miami many years ago, so I had a kahila of many elderly people who either grew up in America when there was no Jewish education here, and they came from observant homes or they were balei tshuva, but they never really had any real serious Jewish education. So they kept Shabbos, they didn't drive on Shabbos, they didn't turn on the lights, but they didn't know too much about Hilcha Shabbos. They didn't know too much about the intricacies of the laws of Shabbos. So I decided that uh, these people are the ones who come to Mincha and Mariv. There's usually 15, 20 minutes between Mincha and Mariv to give a short cheer. I was going to go through the 39 malachas of Shabbos with these people. And every day we learned a little bit more about the laws of Shabbos. We were up to the law of Borer. Borer means selecting, separating good from bad on Shabbos. You'll excuse the pun, but they're very nitpicking laws. All right, if you can take the bad from the good or the good from the bad for immediate use with a utensil, without a utensil, very, very intricate laws. And we were learning them. And a uh, middle-aged professional balabas of mine fell into this shear by mistake. He had come from Mariv because he had yard site, and he miscalculated when Mariv would start. So he walked into the shul in the middle of the shear, and when you walked into the shul, you were in the shear. And he was too polite to walk out, so he sat down. And I see he's listening to these intricate laws, and his eyes are bulging. And after the shir, he comes over to me and he says, Rabbi, are there really people who do all of this? I was about six months out of the kolel. I didn't think there were anybody who didn't do all of this. So we were both a little surprised. Let's use him as an example. Here's a guy who's Shomer Shabbos, very fine, observant Jew. But Borer, that's like too much. I don't want to know from this Borer thing. I didn't know about it last week. My parents didn't know about it, right? And I don't want to bother to learn about it or to change or to improve my ob observance of Shabbos. I want to keep Shabbos the way I did last week and the week before that because that's comfortable. Now there's a problem. People like to be comfortable, but they also don't like to have guilt and feel guilty. So there's a big problem here, because if you don't want to improve, how do you avoid feeling guilty about it? So the Yetzirah created seven defense mechanisms to enable a person not to improve and not to feel guilty about it. And those are the seven levels that Rashi talks about, and I'll explain them one by one in great detail. The first level that you have to go down if you don't want to improve spiritually, but you don't want to feel guilty about it, the first level down is don't learn. That doesn't mean don't learn anything. 
You can learn anything but Hilcha Shabbos. Don't learn the laws of Shabbos if you don't want to know about this law of Boder. Because the less you know, right, the more you can convince yourself that this Boder has nothing to do with you. Boder is probably for farmers, for industry. What in the world in my own little kitchen can I do anything that would be a problem with Boder? So ignorance is bliss. So by not learning about it, you can't feel guilty about not doing it because you can convince yourself that it has nothing to do with you. So that's the first level you must go down. Don't learn about the things that you don't want to do and don't want to improve. Second level down, which is almost automatic. If you don't learn, you won't do. So he would take this person and he likes to eat fish with bones on Shabbos. But it's a big deal to start taking the bones out of the fish. And one day he's passing by a novelty store and he sees a hand-operated professional bone plucker. You put the food in this machine, you pull down the lever and it eviscerates the fish, takes all the bones out in one swoop. He says, wow, this is great for Shabbos. So he buys it and he silver plates it and he inscribes on it, Lekovit Shabbos Kodesh. And every Friday night, his wife brings ceremoniously all the fish they're going to eat on Shabbos. Friday night and Shabbos day and Shalash Shudas. And they put it into the machine and he says, Lekovit Shabbos Kodesh, and he pulls down the lever and all the bones come out of the fish. He has now desecrated the Shabbos with an Issa Doraisa. Everything that could be wrong is wrong. It's the bad from the good with a utensil and not for immediate use. But he's doing it the covered Shabbos because he doesn't know that there's anything wrong with it. So he's already down to the second level. He doesn't learn. He's not able to do because he doesn't know. Okay, this is, goes on maybe for weeks, months, years, until one Friday night his neighbor invites him to eat at his home. And the neighbor is more knowledgeable and more uh, careful in observing Shabbos. So they serve the fish. And sure enough, it's fish with bones. And he says to himself, gee, I should have brought my bone plucker, make the meal a little bit easier. But he notices that his friend is observing the fish, picking up his fork, putting it down, looking at the fish from this angle, another angle, and he begins to feel guilty because he realizes there must be something to do with Borer, with getting those bones out of the fish, and that's why my neighbor is not eating the fish right away, but observing and studying how to do it properly. And he begins to feel guilty, because this guy is making him feel guilty, right, because there's something to do with Borer, with these, with these bones. So now he has to go down to level number three. Level number three is... Moes ba'acherim ha'osim. You become disgusted with people who keep mitzvahs. Not all the mitzvahs, just the ones you don't want to do. So he looks at his neighbor and he says the following. This is not normal. Normal people don't study their fish before they eat it. This is a fanatic. This man is off the wall. This man is an extremist. You pick the word. He's a chnyok. Right? He's a kitsoni. You pick the word in any language. There's a word that describes people who are doing what you don't want to do to make them into monsters. And therefore, I don't feel guilty anymore. I don't want to be a chnyok. I don't want to be a, a, a fanatic. I just want to be normal. So I don't feel guilty anymore for not studying the fish and deciding, should I take the bones of the fish or the fish with the bones, with the fork, without the fork? That's for fanatics. I am very comfortable being a normal person. So I have demonized the people who are doing what I don't want to do, and that doesn't make me feel guilty anymore. So I go home, I get a good night's sleep, wake up tomorrow, the next morning, Shabbos morning, and make a bracha, shaloh asan ichnyok, and I feel very, very comfortable. But I'm down to level number three. No. I go to shul the next day. The rabbi gets up to speak. 
And the rabbi says, you know, I've noticed that we have many fine, observant families in this shul, but people who know nothing about the intricacies of Shmira Shabbos. For instance, like Borer. So I think I'm going to devote my sermon today to a little bit about Borer. I'm sitting there, a captive audience. I don't want to hear about this Borer thing because I don't want to feel guilty. And the less I know about it, the better it is. So how do I go about now? I said, the rabbi's a fanatic. He's my rabbi. I can't. My conscience won't accept that. So now I have to go down to level number four. Level number four, says Rashi, is sonei es ha-chachomim. You begin to hate the chachomim. What does that mean? You say to yourself, it's not that I don't want to learn the laws of Borer. Chas v'sholem. I'd love to learn them. Not from that mouth. Why? Because that rabbi, 20 years ago, passed my grandmother in the street and didn't say good morning. He's an animal. That's not a... That's not somebody that I want to learn Torah from. I wouldn't listen to the Ten Commandments from that person. Not chas v'sholem because I don't want to learn, but not from him. People who make you feel guilty, so you have to demonize them in order not to feel guilty. If you don't think that's true, I'll tell you a true story. Again, when I was a rabbi in Miami, I was very young. And I had many balabatim who were older than me, professionals. And one of them didn't like me in a big way. And um, that's the, one of the uh, hazards of being involved with the community, that uh, sometimes you do things and you deserve, that people shouldn't like you. Sometimes you don't do anything and still people don't like you. So uh, this person, though, I didn't remember doing anything that should make him not like me. And he really, really didn't like me. And I couldn't figure out why. And I was too uh, intimidated to approach him until 20 minutes before Ne'ila on Yom Kippur. We had a break, and I said to myself, this guy really doesn't like me. And maybe I really did something, right, that uh, really is terrible, right? The way he didn't like me, maybe I killed his mother, and I forgot about it. But he didn't like his mother either, so it didn't really <laughs> jive. So I said, and how am I going to go, you know, finish Yom Kippur? And, and, and maybe I really did something terrible. So I called him over privately, over on the side. And I sat next to him and I said, look, I get the feeling that you don't like me in a big way. And I must have done something to cause that and to deserve it. So if you'll tell me what it was, I'd be glad to apologize. And we can go into Ne'ila as friends. He looks me in the eye. I could see it like it's happening now. He looks me in the eye. He says, Rabbi, I hate your guts. I said, okay, good. That's just what I had to hear before Neela 20 minutes. Why? He said, because when you finish your drushes, I feel guilty. I thought to myself, I guess I'm doing my job, but I didn't say that to him. I said to him, look, that's not the intention. You know, if you feel guilty, why don't you, you know, walk out without making a big deal, go take a walk, doing the drosha, go to the bathroom, whatever. Don't make it obvious that you're walking out, but you don't have to listen. Come with earplugs, whatever. In any case, we shook hands, and we went into Neela as friends, and that lasted till about the first day of Sukkot, I think, and then something else happened. But in any case, that's the, that's the reality of life. People of authority who make you feel guilty so uh, you have to demonize them, that you shouldn't feel guilty. So now down to level, level number four. Okay, not everybody is like me, though, that they don't want to uh, improve. So a few of my friends come to me, my chevra, after the rabbi's drasha, and they say, you know, the rabbi's right. We're Shomer Shabbos. We believe in all of this, and we don't know the first thing about the laws of Shabbos. So we've asked the rabbi to give us a shear every Tuesday night on the laws of Shabbos, and we're starting this week with the laws of Borer. Want to join? Ay vey. It's the last thing in the world I want to do is join a shear on Borer. But what do I tell my friends? So now I have to go down to level number five. Level number five is monea acheri milasos. I try to prevent people from keeping mitzvahs. 
Not all the mitzvahs, just the ones I don't want to do. Because if they keep them, they make me feel guilty. So I tell my friends, oh, you want to become more religious? You want to learn about borer? Kol HaKavot, right? But let me warn you, this is a step in a very dangerous direction because it never ends with borer. You start becoming more religious, you start being more machmir, it's a slippery slope. I give you two weeks, you'll be taking a shower with a black hat on. No shiloh, that's what you're headed. You're headed to be fanatics. Two more weeks, your wives will be wearing their tichel past their nose. They won't be able to breathe. This is pikuach nefesh, right? You're going to become fanatics. There's no end to this. Don't start. Let me warn you. So that's level number five. Monea acher milasos. Okay, some people may listen to me. And some are more honest and say, no, we don't want to become fanatics. We just want to improve. So now I have to go down to level number six. Level number six is kofr b'mitzvahs. I deny the validity of the mitzvah. Not all the mitzvahs, just the one I don't want to do. What does that mean? I tell my friends, okay, you want me to come to the shir on borer? Let me tell you, if borer would be a real mitzvah, I would be the first to join the shir. But let me tell you, borer is only a chumrah. And we didn't have that chumrah in our, we were makel. We were lenient in our home. Or borer is only a minig. We didn't have that minig. Or Borer is only one opinion. I don't know who the other opinion is, but there's always another opinion. I'm for him. <laughs> so he's reduced Borer to a minig, to a chumrah, to one opinion. Not a mitzvah anymore. I don't have to do it. That's very good until somebody comes with a Mishnah Brura and a Kafachayim from the Svardim and from Rabbi Eider right, and uh, every book in English, right, from modern Orthodox and uh, archaic Orthodox, whatever you want, and everybody holds that using a professional bone plucker on Shabbos is a Torah prohibition. It's not one opinion, it's not a minig, it's not a chumrah, it's the halacha. Now I'm stuck. So now I have to go down to level number seven. Level number seven is kofr b'ikr. Now, that really sounds very, very strict, but it's not. What does kofr b'ikr mean? It means the following. I tell my friends, okay, you got me. It's a mitzvah, but I can't do everything. I have a life to live. I let God interfere with my life up to a point, but this is too much. This I can't do. This interferes with my life too much. What does that mean? That the mitzvah is not an ikr in my life. I have more important things in my life than mitzvahs. And this mitzvah is not a major thing in my life. I have more important things to worry about. And if the mitzvah is not an ikr thing in my life, then the mitzvah, the commander of that mitzvah, is not an ikr in my life either. That's called kofar b'ikr. I deny that God is a central point in my life. He is a peripheral point. And up until the point where I'm comfortable, I'll let him interfere with my life. Beyond that, not. That's called kofar b'ikr. And you have to be on one of these levels. If you have an area, you could be in 99% a totally observant Jew. And in that one area that rubs you wrong, whether it's Shabbos or Kashris or Tzniyas or business ethics. This is the way I did it last week. I cheated people. I'm going to do it next week. I don't want to learn about this. And you can convince yourself that it's okay. Because it's okay to cheat Goyim, which is not true. But a person who doesn't learn can convince himself. And non-religious Jews, they're like Goyim anyway. And religious Jews, most of them are fakers. So anyway, they're all like, all like Goyim. So you can cheat everybody. And I don't want to know any difference. I don't want to learn about it. So you have to be on one of these seven levels. If you don't think this doesn't apply to everybody, I'll tell you. I once gave this shear in Hebrew to a group of Israeli Beis Yaakov teachers and principals. Okay, you can get the, what, what we're talking about here. And before I gave the shear, I said to myself, what are you doing? These, these people can't relate to this. They don't know people like this. They won't know what you're talking about. 
But I said, no, it's, maybe it's a good idea. They should know that such a, such a phenomenon exists in the world. So I gave the shir. When I finished, a Hasidish Beis Yaakov principle came to me. And she said, Harav, you were talking to me. I said, if you think I was talking to you, you don't understand what I was talking about. <laughs> she said, no, I know what you were talking about, and you were talking to me. Why, she said. I'll tell you. She said that we belong to a sect of Hasidim where our Rebbe allows us to wear a shaitl, a wig, without a hat on top. And that's what we do. My daughter got married a few months ago, and we bought her an expensive wig after the wedding, for, for after the wedding. And there comes Sheva Brachas, and she's not wearing the wig. She's wearing a techo. So I figured she doesn't know how to put the wig on, she's too under pressure. Week after Sheva Brachas, no wig. Finally, after two, three weeks, Shabbos, no wig. I said to her, did you lose the wig that we bought you? She said, no, my husband and I discussed that we'd rather be more strict and not wear the wig, right, as other Hasidim, and just cover our hair with a, cover my hair with a tichel. She said, at that moment, I thought to myself, what kind of fanatic is she? Who does she think she is? How come she's not wearing a, a wig like everybody else? And it bothered me. Why wasn't I proud of her? Okay, she wants to be extra strict. Why did I demonize her? And you explained it to me now. Because in my mind, if the next day the Rebbe would say, no more wigs, I would resist. And because of that, I had to look at her as a demon. And now I understand what was going through my mind. If it applied to this Beis Yaakov Hasidish principle, it applies to all of us. In every area that a person doesn't want to grow, whatever it may be, and wants to remain static and stagnant, in that area has to be on one of these seven levels because it's human nature not to want to feel guilty. And the only way not to do that is to be on one of these seven levels or all of them. All of them. So that's how bad it is for a person who doesn't grow. However, it's not just an idea of aspiring. I want to grow in Torah. I want to be more religious, more observant, more spiritual. I want to improve my character. All that's very nice. But there's a lot more to make it real. First thing that you need. They tell the story. It's not a chazal. It's just a story of a man who wanted very much to be a multimillionaire. And he realized that Bederech HaTeva, naturally, there's no way if he worked for the next 500 years and saved every penny, he wouldn't be a multimillionaire. There's only one way that he could be a multimillionaire if he won the lottery. So every day after Shemona Esrei, three times a day, he would beg God, please, God, let me win the lottery. He would cry and beg. And he would say, God, if I win the lottery, half the money I give right away to Tzedakah. The other half I will only use for good things and Torah causes. If I win the lottery, you, God, gain. Please let me win the lottery. And this went on for 20 years. After 20 years, the angels came to the Rabban Shalom, and they said, Rabban Shalom, we can't take this anymore. Every day we've got to listen to this guy cry and beg, let me win the lottery, let me win the lottery. You know, he sounds sincere. What would be so terrible, Rabban Shalom, if you let him win the lottery? And God said, I'd love to let him win the lottery, but he never bought a ticket. You can want and want and aspire, but if you never buy the ticket, you're not going to win the lottery. And the truth is, there is a medrash that says the following. The dreams of tzaddikim are both in the heaven and the earth. Yaakov Avinu dreamt there was a ladder on the ground and its head was in the heavens. So his dream encompassed heaven and earth. The dreams of wicked people. They're not in the heavens and not on the earth. Why? Paro dreamt. Where was he? Standing on the Nile, on the water. Not in the heavens and not on the earth. What's the meaning of the Medrash? I think it means the following. Tzadikim have aspirations, lofty goals in the heavens. 
but they put a ladder firmly on the ground with rungs. They have a program how to reach their uh, aspirations and goals. They don't just want, they have to put it into practice, slowly but surely, and climb one rung after another. Rishayim don't have lofty goals, and they don't have any program. Everything is wishy-washy on the water. So the first rule is that if you aspire and you want to grow, then have short-range goals. How are you going to do that? I want to be able to know the entire Torah. Fine. Did you ever open a book? No. No. So start today with one page, tomorrow another page, and eventually you'll know. So that's the first rule. In order to make goals and aspirations reasonable and, and real, you have to put a firm ladder on the ground and climb it one rung at a time. Second thing. The Vilna Gong explains the following Pasuk in Mishle. Lev chacham liamino, the lev ksil lismolo. A wise person's heart's to the right, and a fool's heart's to the left. Says the Vilna Gong, what it means is the following. When you're learning a Sefer in Hebrew, what you've learned already is to your right. What you've yet to learn is to your left. A foolish person always looks at the left, what he hasn't learned, and he gives up. I'll never be able to do this. The wise person also wants to learn more and more. But every once in a while, he looks to the right and gets the strength from what he's accomplished to want to accomplish more. And there's no contradiction between them. You can be sameach bechelko, you can be happy with what you've accomplished, but not satisfied with it. I want more, but I'm happy with what I've accomplished. Because if you don't recognize what you've accomplished, and you're only looking at what you don't have and where you would like to be, you're going to get very frustrated. So you need to balance between being happy with what you've accomplished at the same time not being satisfied with it. The third principle that's necessary is growth is not something that happens overnight. It's a lifelong quest. And it has to happen slowly according to a person's ability to do. The Chafetz Chaim used to come into the Beis Medrash in Radin and put out the lights at 12 o'clock midnight and force his students to go to sleep. And they were youngsters who said, what kind of red-blooded, budding Talmud Chacham wants to go to sleep at 12 o'clock? We want to stay in the Beis Medrash and learn till 3. I mean, how's it going to look when Art Scroll writes our biography and it says when we were 17, we went, went to sleep at 12 o'clock? Shafetz Chaim said, that's very nice, that's the Yetzirah. She said, Yetzirah, what's the Yetzirah going to gain if we learn another three hours? So I'll tell you. You're going to learn till three, you have to get up at seven to daven. If you don't get up, we know already what the Yetzirah gained. So let's say you do get up. How long can you keep up a schedule like that of going to sleep at three and getting up at seven? A week, two weeks, three weeks, till you fall from exhaustion off your feet and end up in bed for a month and not able to learn anything. So the Sultan is a wise businessman. He's willing to invest a few hours extra of learning now for no learning for a month. And even if that doesn't happen, says the Chafetz Chaim, you're going to shorten your life because you didn't get enough sleep when you were a teenager. So years will be taken away from learning later on. So that's what it says in davening. Every night we say, Take the satan away from in front of us and behind us. The satan is an obstacle. I understand you can have an obstacle in front of you. How can you have an obstacle behind you? He says what it means is the following. Sometimes a person wants to improve, gets this bug to do something good spiritually. A woman wants to do chesed. She has this bug to do chesed. And the satan sees that if he stands in front of her, she'll steamroll him over. No way of stopping her. So you know what he does? He runs around behind her and he pushes. You want to do chesed? Fine. Chesed in the morning, chesed in the afternoon, chesed at night. Don't see your husband, your children. Don't eat, don't sleep. 
How long can she keep that up till she burns out and doesn't want to look at chesed for the next 20 years? A month? Two months? So the sultan says, fine, I'll invest in a little chesed now and push her so there won't be chesed for 20 years. That's the sultan me'achareinu. That's the sultan behind you, pushing you beyond your capabilities. So uh, my Rosh Hashiva of Gifter, after the Six-Day War, so there's a tremendous uh, feeling of tshuva in, Kla in Eretz Yisrael. They, had, they sent for tefillin. There wasn't enough tefillin in Eretz Yisrael to, to, to satisfy all the people who wanted to start putting on tefillin. She so said, one story, there was a, a, a f pilot, a Jewish pilot, who was uh, attacked by three MiGs. And they were converging on him. And he realized this is it. There's no way of him escaping, and this is it. So he said, Shema Yisrael. He went into a cloud, and when he came out of the cloud, the MiGs disappeared. He realized a miracle happened. When he landed, he made a nether. He's going to become religious. Everything. Shabbos, Kashrus, Tarasimus, everything. A month later, he came to the Rav of the city, and he said, how much do I have to pay to be Mater Nether? I can't keep this up. My, my family think I came from Mars. I can't do it. As Marashi Shiva said, if somebody had told him, don't make any Nidorim, don't become from, you said Shema when you went into that, that cloud, every night before you go to sleep, say Shema. And for that, a month, he would have said Shema. And then after that, they would have told him, you know what, there's a Shema in the morning too. Say that also. And he would have added that. And then they would have told me, no, is there something to wear tzitzis when you say Shema, since you're, not men you're mentioning that. And then he would put on tzitzis. And then maybe a few weeks later, tell him about tefillin. And slowly but surely, he would grow, and his family would grow along with him. But since he tried to jump up the staircase all at once, when you jump up a staircase, you usually fall back and break your neck. So the next rule is, yes, a person has to aspire and has to grow, but he has to do it at a pace that is good for him. That not too fast and not too slow. And for that, you need guidance from Rabonim, from friends who know you, to know what the, the pace has to be. And lastly, one more, one more caveat in how to use goals and aspirations properly. Torah says like this, what does it mean? They had to destroy the seven nations that occupied Eretz Israel and take over the land. So God said, we're going to have to do this slowly. Because if you do it too fast, you won't be able to populate the land at the speed that you're destroying these wicked people. And the land will be desolate, and in desolate land come wild animals and give you problems. So in order not to cause this problem, we're going to destroy the nation slowly so you can populate the land at the same speed that you are destroying the Rishoyim, and then you won't have to worry about wild animals. Rashi asks the following question. God promised us that when we're keeping the Torah properly, we won't have to worry about wild animals. So what's the problem? Ella Rashi says, God knew we weren't going to uh, observe the Torah properly and we'd have to worry about wild animals. Think for a second what that means. Let me tell you what it's like and then we'll see what we learn from this Pasuk. Imagine a teacher. I say this to teachers many times. A, fourth grade, a, 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 a woman who's going to teach fourth grade for the first time in her life. She spends the whole summer vacation creating a lesson plan for fourth grade. Beautiful lesson plan. She comes the first day of school, and she finds that the children are on the third grade level. Why? Because the first day of school in the third grade, they lock the teacher in the closet and party the rest of the year. So they haven't learned a word in third grade. They are basically third graders, just a year older. And her lesson plan is way above their head. She has a choice now. She can say, tough luck. 
if you had done what you were supposed to do, right, you'd be on the right level. And my lesson plan would be perfect. So you're going to suffer, and I'm going to give you my lesson plan, whether you can handle it or not. Or she can say, you know, I have to accommodate their shortcomings and change my plan. How does God function? The second way. God could have said, you know, I told you to observe the Torah properly, and you wouldn't have to worry about wild animals, and I would like to destroy these wicked people because they pollute the world as fast as possible. And my plan was perfect if you would do what you were supposed to do. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. So now if we ex exercise my plan, you're going to suffer from wild animals. Tough luck. You deserve to suffer. God doesn't do that. He changes his plan. Now we'll do it slowly. What's the corollary to that? Sometimes people have tremendous expectations for themselves or for their children or for their parents or for their friends. A woman has a nine-year-old boy who she sees is going to be the next Chazonish, the next Vilnagon. This boy is really studious, and he has a good head, and, and, and she envisions she's going to be the mother of the Chazonish. Nine-year-old, and she, she has expectations for her son. She wants him to grow into the greatest Talmud Chacham of the generation. And one day, she sees this nine-year-old riding his bicycle. She says, what are you doing? The Chazonish doesn't ride bicycles. Get off that bicycle, get in the house, put your feet in cold water, and learn for the next 20 hours. She's going to destroy that child. He's a nine-year-old. He has to drive his bike. He's not the Chazonish yet. But sometimes we have expectations for ourselves or our family or others, and we demand from them what our expectations are and not what reality is. So yes, you have to have aspire towards greatness and want others to grow too. But you have to deal with yourself and others as they are, giving them an incentive to grow, but not demanding from them what you would like them to be had they grown already. <coughs> All of those things are caveats to be able to grow properly. So if you want to... Uh, create a spiritual portfolio. I think that was the topic. I wasn't really sure what it meant. But in any case, the, uh, I guess that's what I spoke about. The, um, you have to take all of this into consideration. You have to want to grow. You can't stagnate. And you have to realize that if you resist growth in any area, you're automatically going to be going down that down escalator seven levels to the bargain basement of Kofor Be'ikr, because that's human nature. But it, with all the importance of growing and aspiring, you have to do it in a proper way. You have to have a ladder, a program, not just aspire, but it has to be something that's based on a program of how to grow. It has to be done in a way that you pace it in a way that you can handle it, and it has to be that you appreciate what you've accomplished, and not only look at where you'd like to be and where you're not, but also be happy with what, you're, what you've accomplished, not satisfied with it when it comes to spiritual things, and to deal with yourself and others as reality is, not as your expectations are. And if you do that, then life becomes a constant mission and travel of wanting and effectively growing in Yiddishkeit. It's a lifelong quest. Never reach perfection. But the Rabbanu Shalom crowns you with perfection in the next world if you put in that effort to, to aspire and to grow towards perfection in this world. If we do that, then we'll bring ourselves closer to perfection, and with that we'll bring the world to perfection. Just let me end with a story. This is not a chazal either, it's just a story. I heard it at a graduation once. There was a man reading a magazine, and his little five-year-old was bothering him incessantly, and he couldn't make any headway in the magazine. He noticed that one of the pages of the magazine 
was a map of the world. So he tore the page out, tore it into 20 little pieces, called his little son in and said, here's a puzzle. It's a map of the world. I want you to go and put it together, and I don't want you to come back here until you finish. Now he figured the five-year-old has no idea what the map of the world looks like. The only way he can put it together is by matching the contours of the tears of the pieces. It's going to take him hours to do. So he has some hours now of peace and quiet. Fifteen minutes later, the kid comes back. I finished. Father says, impossible. There's no way you could have put the map of the world back together unless you knew what the map of the world looks like. You don't know what it looks like. He said, come and look. And sure enough, on the glass top of a coffee table, the map of the world is perfectly arranged. The father says, wow, you're a genius. You must have known what the map of the world looks like, and you put it together based on the picture. He said, no, it was really easy. You see, on the other side of the page, there was a picture of a person. I just put the person together, and the whole world fell into place. <laughs> so, Amir Sashem, if we aspire and grow towards perfection, we'll bring the whole world together with us towards perfection, and we'll see very soon Bias Goel Tzedek Meher of Yomenu.